Hello, everyone. This is Phil Lawson from Laird 7 Technologies. I'm Vice President of Product Management at Laird 7. Today's webinar is entitled, How and Why to Replace Your Cisco ACE XML Gateway. A bit of an overview on what we're going to cover off today in the presentation. First off, we're going to talk a little bit about the background of the Cisco ACE XML Gateway product, uh, talk about what customers are telling us about the Cisco product, deal with some questions around potentially replacing the Cisco ACE XML Gateway, talk about what Layer 7 can do for Cisco customers, and walk through a Layer 7 client case study that we recently completed with a couple of Cisco clients. We're also going to talk a little bit about what migrating services policies and other configuration from a Cisco ACE XML gateway entails, and then have a brief summary. Throughout this presentation, if you'd like to ask questions, you can use the Q&A capability built into WebEx, and I'll try and deal with as many of those questions as I can towards the end of the presentation. There's an interesting history behind the ACE XML networking gateway that uh, some people may not be aware of, and that is that it originally came from a different company. That company's name was Reactivity. Reactivity was founded in 1998. They predominantly provided software-based products up until about 2003. They had several software-based products that were designed to act as service firewalls or XML gateways. Uh, but in 2003, they decided to introduce an appliance-based version of their software service firewall, which they renamed the XML firewall. That product went through a number of naming changes over time. And in 2005, they sort of put that product line into two products, the XML Security Gateway, which was focused primarily, as the name suggests, on XML security, and a SOA gateway, which included data adaption features. At that point, Reactivity had a pretty strong product. Uh, they were doing fairly well in the markets. They were an independent company. Um, in 2005, Cisco decided to do uh, enter this market as well. Cisco introduced their um, application-oriented networking, or Aeon product. The Aeon product was a bit of a hybrid product. It included aspects of their Catalyst Switch series. In fact, it was part of the same family from a sort of business unit perspective. But they also included, a, if you like, a blade, which had a XML processor on it, had some other software, and in fact instantiated an XML firewall um, on that in that product. Uh, Cisco Aeon was not very successful in the marketplace. Um, there seem to be numerous reasons, and I encourage you to do a Google search and see what the various analysts and pundits thought of Cisco Aeon. But in 2007, rather than building their own product, Cisco decided to buy. And what they bought was the Reactivity product. They bought the entire company. And they rebranded the Reactivity X XML firewall as the ACE XML gateway. And throughout the presentation, I'll probably just refer to that as AXG just for simplicity. So the product came originally from Reactivity, um, has fairly long lineage. Reactivity's product was fairly successful in the marketplace. Cisco purchased that product as a way to address XML um, security and other XML processing issues in their product line and took that to market in 2007. We've talked to various Cisco ACE XML Gateway customers about why they purchased the product, and it kind of boils down to three primary reasons, although there can be many, many others. Um, a lot of these companies may have actually bought the product from Reactivity when it was an independent entity, and then subsequently upgraded with Cisco. In other cases, they actually bought the AXG from Cisco directly. Now, things that customers seem to like about the product is, uh, first off, the technology. Reactivity made a fairly substantial investment of uh, resources some time ago and decided to write their own XML processing engine, and that engine is referred to as Reactor, for software-based XML acceleration. And really what they did was they wrote their own parser and uh, XML processor to deal with everything from XSLT and schema validation all the way on down to things like XML classification. That was a fairly significant step for Reactivity at the time. Um, other vendors, including Layer 7 at that point, were looking at silicon-based technology for XML acceleration. But Reactivity really uh, decided to sit down and write their own um, C-based engine, which they deployed in their product and, in fact, is still in the AXG product today. Another area that customers liked about the Cisco product is usability. And again, this goes back to the Reactivity days, where Reactivity took a very different approach to how they described policies or how you build services or how you actually even use the product and came up with a fairly smooth way of having customers get assistance as they had to do common tasks. So for example, if you wanted to deploy an XML firewall for a specific service, they had a fairly simple way to step you through that process 
and ensure that you ended up with a valid XML firewall in the end. So from an ease of use perspective, and to some extent from a flexibility perspective, although that was improved later with Cisco, uh, the product was very, very well considered by the customers. The last area was really functional issues. Um, the Cisco, sorry, the reactivity product, when it first came to market and subsequently grew over time, always had a fairly good range of capabilities. Um, it was capable of addressing large numbers of use cases, supported various standards, had pretty good third-party support, in fact, for its time, probably some of the best third-party support out there. And that got continued on as customers you know, had a look at the product. Cisco continued to add capabilities onto the product over time, and functionally, um, they felt it was a pretty good product. So with all of these positives, um, why is it now we're uh, even having this webinar about replacing Cisco AXG, and for that matter, why would customers even consider doing this? Again, some of the same customers that we've spoken to, the issues that they've had for Cisco AXG and the reason that they're considering replacing it, or in some cases already have, are the following. Performance issues. Um, they found that uh, the performance of the product is no longer meeting their needs, despite the fact that uh, Reactivity did invest in XML acceleration and software. The performance of the product today is simply not where it needs to be for some of our customers. Uh, there are people out there who have high performance um, XSL or schema validation or other type processing or very deep and complex policies. And the Cisco ACE product is simply not meeting their needs. They've also run into issues with interoperability, particularly around standards and third party support. Now, I know I said earlier that the same customers like the third-party support when they purchase the product. The issue here seems to be more in terms of third-party products moving out with different versions, different third-party products appearing that aren't supported, and standards progressing as well. And the issue with some of the standards are that if you don't support one particular version of the standard, you end up having interoperability issues with other products that are out there, and those can be products from other unrelated third parties, for example, people who make app servers or development environments, or they could be interoperability issues with the third party products that you want to support, things like identity management systems and federation systems perhaps. Also, some of our customers were running into issues addressing specific use cases and somewhat related to some of the interoperability issues, there were specific capabilities that were missing from the product. In many cases, the customers consider these enhancements but the feedback that we got from some of those customers was that Cisco considered that actually a feature request. The important difference there being that as a product company, enhancements are something that you probably roll out um, fairly frequently um, over time, whereas feature requests typically require a fair amount of development and commitments and have to be layered onto a roadmap. And that can become a bit of an issue, especially given the next item, which is product obsolescence. Um, many of the customers that we've spoken to <coughs> who are currently using the Cisco um, AXG product have had um, conversations with us that Cisco has indicated to them that they're no longer continue forward on with this product. And as far as they're concerned, this means they're potentially stranding their investment because they have a product now which will do exactly what it does today, but no more. And this product will also uh, not have any roadmap associated with it. So this puts in jeopardy um, a lot of future projects, uh, potential future services, other business offerings that may be out there, or anything else that customers want to do moving forward with the product. So if you are a Cisco ACE customer and you are considering you know, migrating away from that product, there's some fairly important questions that we think you need to ask before you know, going too far down this path. And a lot of this is common sense, but this is born out of experience that we've had with customers who have been considering migrating with us or with other people and, and exactly kind of the pro thought process they've gone through. First off, it's important to understand what your functional needs are. Um, if you have existing services, if you have policies, if you have test cases, any other information that you use to initially deploy the AXG product, that should be accessible to you. In some cases, that can be a challenge. Uh, some of the customers who purchased this product uh, back in the reactivity days, the staff that actually implemented this or some of the records that are associated with the implementation may not be easily accessible. And this can cause some problems because now you have to go back and understand why something was implemented the way it was implemented. The best way to do that is always to understand what the goals are. So if you have a good understanding of the services you're currently supporting, if you have a good understanding of why you've created specific policies around that, or if you have other test cases, then that's really important in terms of implementation. 
Also, you have to understand, are those needs actually going to change? We talked a little bit earlier about some customers telling us the reason that they're moving from the system product is because it doesn't really have a roadmap. Um, it doesn't can't meet the changing needs that they have for new services or new business processes. So that, of course, requires an understanding on the customer's part on any new potential phases to projects. So if this was implemented as part of some project or some initiative inside the company, are there additional phases where it plays a role and does it need to do different things? Potential new services that might be being offered. It's possible that services that were offered previously are a starting point and there's going to be offering new changed or, or new or changed services as a result. And of course, new business models. As people start looking towards things like the cloud and other ways of sharing services that they already have, those business models will impact implementation details, which could impact any migration or any existing installation of the Cisco AXG product. Another question which may not seem immediately obvious is which form factors best fit the needs? Uh, back when reactivity made the transition from software to hardware, pretty much all of the products in the market offered a hardware-based version of their product. And primarily the reason for doing so was either performance, that is, uh, we had XML processing performance that required hardware and a dedicated platform, or perhaps deployments in the DMZ. Typically, DMZ applications, uh, people like to have them deployed as appliances. There are some cases where they'll deploy them with software, mainly to reduce you know, any kind of potential um, threat surface for potential hackers or any other malicious attacks on, on, on important and vital systems. But nowadays, the market has somewhat shifted. We'll get into this a little bit later. But you can get similar capabilities, if not identical capabilities, um, from virtual appliances. Those are appliances built using virtualization technology, or for software, or you can actually get them in the cloud, or as hardware. So you may need to reconsider which form factors really fit your needs the best. Again, back from the reactivity in Cisco time, the only version, the only form factor the Cisco ACE product is available in today is as hardware. Um, a long time ago, it was available as software, and there was a transition period where they had something called the Gateway D, which was a shrunk-down gateway. Basically, it was a small um, computer that had the software preloaded on it that could be used for development and test purposes, obviously at a lower price point and performance point. But now you have a lot of options open to you from vendors, and it's something you need to consider very carefully if you're moving forward is, you know, do you really need to have appliances everywhere, or can you live with having hardware in some places, virtual appliances in other places, and perhaps software elsewhere. Another consideration is performance and availability objectives. Um, as services ramp up with time, you may be concerned about the actual aggregate throughput of your services. You may be concerned about latency um, overall, end-to-end um, -end kind of latency, or particular back-end response latency where you're dealing with app servers. You may also be concerned about availability. And availability takes on a number of different dimensions. One is within the same data center, you may want to make sure that you have redundancy in case of a hardware failure um, if you're deploying hardware. In some cases, you may want geographic, geographically diverse systems, primarily for disaster recovery, but sometimes for load sharing or follow the sun type service. So these are all considerations in determining not only the physical deployment of this at a networking level, but also the actual sizing that you would need to incorporate in order to replace size of the same capacity or give yourself more capacity. Another consideration is understanding which third-party entities you need to support. And I use the term entities here somewhat vaguely, but really it's designed to encompass any product living outside of your code, um, your systems, your existing systems, as well as you know, any potential deployment around the uh, Cisco AXG. That can include everything from something as simple as an LDAP um, or perhaps something like a SiteMinder, all the way up to management systems like HP OpenView, registry repositories that you may have deployed from companies like HP or Software AG, as well as antivirus products from companies like Symantec, as well as something else. There's a lot, wide variety of third-party entities that products like this tend to interface to, um, usually for authentication and authorization but in some cases they're being managed or in some cases there's service performance information that may be coming from a product like Progress Action Now, for example, which defines you know, how a service is performing end to end and therefore you're gonna need to support some form of instrumentation. There's a lot of different dimensions to this and a lot of it just comes down to understanding the architecture, where the product fits within your ecosystem and the kinds of interactions that are required 
to support those use cases and policies and services that we talked about at the very beginning of the slide. And probably the last thing to consider is if you are making a change, this is sort of like uh, changing computers or, or changing cars or you know some other technolog technological analogy out there, is that there possibly are um, some fairly significant benefits um, in looking at other options. Technology advances. There are things in the past that you could not do that you can now do today a little bit more cost feasibly. There are even functional capabilities that perhaps when the Cisco ACE product was deployed couldn't be um, couldn't be supported by that product, but can be supported by a replacement product. So I think it's always good to take a step back and say, is the way that I did it whenever I did it still the best way to do it, or are there some alternatives, and are there other problems I can solve? This might actually be a significant advantage to you as you're creating the business case to replace the Cisco product, because frankly, a rip and replace is never necessarily easy to get by business managers inside an organization, and it would be nice to have some kind of revenue or other benefit to deploying a new product. Taking on additional services or potentially encompassing more operational capabilities in a device should help make that business case a little bit more feasible. Switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about Layer 7 products, and specifically, I'm going to talk about products that are relevant um, to the Cisco AXG, um, how they relate to that product, and also how they're a little bit different. And this is going to be used to sort of go through a discussion of some of the items we talked about previously, including things like form factors, leading into an analysis of how customers have used our products to replace the Cisco AXG product. Layer 7 products kind of sort themselves into three basic categories. Um, this is a, a slide from our, our standard sales deck, so I am going to take some liberties here as we kind of go through the classification. But most importantly, you can think about it on the left-hand side, is you have um, our hardware-based products. So you have things like our XML Accelerator, XML Data Screen, XML Firewall, and XML Networking Gateway. Those are actual functionally different products. However, they do share a common lineage and a common processing model. So for, in fact, the data screen incorporates accelerator functions. So people who just want to accelerate XML deploy that product. People who want to protect things like REST-based services deploy the data screen. And the firewall encompasses the other two products and so on up the list to the XML networking gateway, which does everything the other products do and then a few other things as well. And we'll get into some of the details around kind of understanding that nomenclature but we'll be focusing in on the XML networking gateway and XML firewall since they're the most relevant when it comes to understanding the relationship of their seven products to Cisco products. We also have some management products. We have the Enterprise Service Manager, which is really a global management product designed to manage multiple deployments of their seven products. Um, can be very, very handy if you're doing geographically diverse or disaster recovery um, scenarios, but most of the interaction that you're going to have with the uh, Layer 7 Secure Span products will be through the Layer 7 Policy Manager. And that is the user interface where you do things like deploy services, create policies, and do some operational management of the product. And we'll get into a little bit of detail around that uh, a few slides in. We also have some other capabilities that I'm also going to touch on in uh, various levels of uh, detail, but I encourage you to go to our website if you're interested in more of this. One is we have an SDK. Um, for developing your own capabilities against the Layer 7 platform. Uh, this is similar to the SDK offered by Cisco. It looks a little different, uh, but fundamentally you can also add custom capabilities to our product yourself uh, just by writing some Java code. We also offer software-based versions of our product as well as virtual appliances, including Amazon machine images. We're also going to be adding Zen images uh, fairly shortly to that list. This is uh, the same capabilities as our XML, uh, our networking gateway and XML firewall in hardware, but instantiated in virtual form. And we'll talk a little bit about why you might care about that and how you would use those products a little bit later. We also have sort of a hybrid product, which we call our OSB appliance. OSB stands for Oracle Service Bus. This is a combination of our product and Oracle's service product, product service bus product um, on an appliance designed to provide uh, acceleration and security for OSB that's deployed in the uh, DMC. Uh, again, this is a fairly narrowly focused product. If you're an Oracle customer and if you find this of interest to you, I encourage you to go to our website. We have a fair amount of material there, and feel free to ask us any questions about what that product does and, and how it works with OSB in general. There's also another product called the XML VPN Client. 
Um, this is quite different than anything that's offered by Cisco. In fact, it's quite different than anything offered by any of our competitors. Um, and it's really designed to on-ramp um, client-side deployments of services. So, for example, if you have a third party uh, or some sort of arm's length relationship with a customer, you can deploy an XML VPN client on their site or they can do it for themselves. And they can use it to facilitate the fast on-ramping to services, including things like policy discovery and dynamic adaptation of messages and things like that. I'm not going to be talking about that very much uh, in this presentation, but again, our website has a fairly copious information about that product as well. So let's talk a little bit about the SecureScan XML firewall. When we first started looking at the Cisco AXG product and we were analyzing it in a fair amount of detail, as we started talking to Cisco customers, it became apparent that they sort of sorted themselves into two loose groups. And I think some of this comes back from the original uh, reactivity product line structure, and I think some of it just comes back from typical use cases. One set of use cases is around literally XML firewalling. You have a concern that you want to make sure you want to have XML-based services, they could be XML SOAP, um, potentially even REST-based services, JSON, things like that. And you want to protect those. And typically the way those are protected is you instantiate a policy um, using a proxy. And the proxy in this case would be our XML firewall. That proxy acts as a proxy for a number of backend services. You can see I have four listed here. And you're performing, you're adding some kind of policy on top of that. That policy can be as simple as performing an authentication, making sure that a user accessing the service is in fact um, can be authenticated. And that user, of course, as we all know, can be an application or can actually be a human user or some combination thereof. Uh, you may want to perform authorization. So you may want to look at not only the user, you may want to look at attributes associated with the user, content or context in the message, and make other policy-based determinations on how that message gets processed, how it gets uh, routed to backends, or even if it gets routed to backends. That can also include support for the OASIS WS standards. Um, it can su include support for the w W3C-based standards. It can include encryption. It can include cryptography of uh, different forms. It can include PKI. It can, it can include a number of different permutations um, when it comes down to it. But fundamentally, the role that you're performing here is as a gatekeeper. You're making sure that as much as possible you're securing those services and that all the transactions, of course, are audited so for non-repudiation purposes, but also for forensic analysis in the case of something going wrong. So that's one of the products that overlaps the Cisco AXG. The other product that overlaps the Cisco product is the SecureSpan XML Networking Gateway. And the XML Networking Gateway does everything the firewall does from a security standpoint, but it also allows you to do more traditional SOA governance. That includes things like um, protocol mediation. So for example, the ability to have an HTTP-based service exposed externally, but in fact that service is getting routed using JMS internally. Or perhaps you're doing some kind of legacy file, sys file server um, application upgrade and you need to have an externally facing FTP interface because you're monitoring um, FTP for some messages or file transfers or potentially even email for that matter, so um, maybe it's SMTP instead. And you're routing that to either an HTTP-based service or JMS-based service or some combination thereof. The XML networking gateway is capable of handling any of those mixed transports, um, mixed message types. It does things like SLA enforcement, including traffic management. Um, there's a variety of other capabilities the XML networking gateway adds above and beyond the firewall. But really, at this point, you're using the product more as an integration broker. You can kind of think of it as a, an ESB in a box, although there are things that ESBs do that uh, this kind of product doesn't do. But the, that kind of idea, you're really using this as integration glue as an intermediary between potentially disparate systems, in many cases legacy systems, that you're trying to serve up to um, other parts of your organization or other organizations in general. Now, those two products, and that's a lot of our products, are available in different form factors. And I want to step through these because I did talk about one of the things to consider when considering a replacement is understanding whether or not you may actually want to choose different form factors. Again, the uh, Cisco AXG is available. It's hardware only at this point. Uh, that was a transition that uh, reactivity did quite some time ago. We also have a hardware-based product, and this is our hardware-based product and some of the technical details on it. 
I won't get into a lot of the details, um, but fundamentally it is a, a one-year product uh, running the latest generation of Intel processors. Um, we also have um, optionally available um, XML acceleration silicon from uh, a company called LSI, and it's their Terrari division. That XML acceleration silicon is not something you necessarily ship with every product, but those customers who are concerned about absolute performance, who are concerned about you know, absolute lowest latency and the largest amount of processing available for XML operations, and in particular, XML transforms and XML schema validations generally benefit from having this silicon. Um, we have a large number of our customers using this silicon. We work very, very closely with Terrari in developing this product over time, and we've been shipping our products uh, with this silicon for, I think, over five years now. And it's proven very successful um, for those customers who are really concerned about performance. If you're not really, really concerned about performance, you'll probably derive little or no benefit from the, uh, the silicon, and it's probably not worth the, the added cost. But we do offer that as an option. It's a factory installed option. It is hardware. Uh, it is in our hardware-based appliances. Um, and it's, it's an option that you can get. Another optional card that you can get is also a hardware-based um, SSL and FIPS 140-2 Level 3 compliant crypto card which also includes an HSM or Harbor Security Module. Um, most people who are concerned about that will typically be in a uh, defense-related industry or anything associated with the U.S. federal government. The U.S. federal government has mandated the use of FIPS 140-2 Level 3 um, as a cryptography standard. I won't get into the details of what that entails, but it is an NIST standard. And uh, we also have some people in the financial services industries who are interested in HSMs because the advantage there is that your keys and, and other important PKI-related information are stored in hardware, and they can't be physically removed without destroying them, and they're in a very, very secure fashion. And HSM technology is used um, all over the place uh, in uh, a lot of uh, different, um, different scenarios, including uh, automated teller machines, uh, as an aside. But again, if this is not something that you're familiar with, chances are you don't need to have it, and that's why it's an optional product that you can get. And you can have both cards in the box at the same time, and we do sell our appliances with uh, both of those cards in it to some customers. The important thing about the appliance is that it does scale more or less linearly as a cluster, so you can gang different appliances together and use that to gain additional capacity. Um, there's also a failover mechanism built in, so we automatically replicate specific configuration information between the appliances, including audit records in some cases, which means that you can have a cluster of three of our products, and if one of them goes down, the rest of the cluster continues to operate um, independently, and so you just lose some capacity potentially. And this is a peered arrangement. There's no master-slave. There's no hot standby, cold standby. It's all running all the time, and effectively, you just have a dynamically changing cluster. And that's really designed to accommodate things like hardware and network failures. Um, it's a single point of management through the Layer 7 manager. That is, you manage a logical cluster as a single entity. You don't actually really see the cluster unless you want to. And so anything going to the cluster has the same policies applied to it, has the same information captured, um, captured for it. And I'll show uh, a quick overview of the manager a little bit later. And there's also a very, very simple way to have license-based upgrades. And this applies to any of our form factors um, you can actually decide at, at whatever point you want to take the license that you purchased, let's say, for one of our hardware appliances and apply it to one of our virtual appliances. And we call that our freedom license. Um, and the real goal here is to make sure that you're not locked into any hard decisions around form factors that you choose to pick. And if you decide to move, for example, from uh, a virtualized environment to a hardware-based one or the other way around, you have an easy uh, way to do that. Speaking of our XML virtual appliance, uh, it's a slide that covers um, some of the information here. Um, it's a really, it actually is quite a viable alternative to our hardware appliances. It has exactly the same capabilities as our hardware appliance. And in fact, you can take policies and configuration you've created on our hardware-based clusters and move them to virtual clusters if you want to. And it's, uh, it's fully supported. It's a very straightforward process. Um, functionally, these products are identical. The real difference here is how they're packaged. We currently provide support for uh, VMware, and um, by extension, the various ESX versions of VMware, so the ESX and ESXi, also known as VMware Infrastructure and vSphere. And uh, we work quite closely with uh, VMware to continue to update the various uh, varieties provided. We've had a lot of success with this product. Uh, it's been sold for quite some time, 
Uh, we were using it internally for quite a bit of time before we offered it uh, to the general public or general market. And um, really where people seem to deploy this the most is for development or POC environments. Um, it's a nice, convenient way to be able to do development against a product without having the expense and, frankly, the, the rack space, power requirements, and fundamentally noise, I guess, of one of our hardware-based products, where you're not concerned about throughput, where you're not concerned about tamper evidence and robustness. The uh, VMware alternative is really a good one. We also have a lot of customers, um, probably over the last year or so, year, year and a half, who are actually deploying VMware as their primary production environment. Um, they've made an investment in VMware infrastructure. Um, they have uh, servers deployed, and they have all of the management tools from VMware to manage these instances. And they just deploy these instances as they need them, scaling them up or down as required. And our product, again, through its clustering capabilities, supports that quite nicely. So it gives you a really nice capability to deploy, you know, sort of internally or potentially even up in the cloud. If your cloud provider uh, allows you to have VMware images up there, you could put it up in the cloud as well and run it there. So it's a very nice, flexible alternative. And again, there really are no trade-offs between the XML virtual appliance and one of our hardware-based appliances, other than the fact that our hardware has access to you know, unlimited resources of the hardware itself, or limited resources. So it tends to be higher performance. But there's nothing to say the VMware version couldn't be um, sufficiently high performance as well, depending upon the target hardware platform that you're deploying it on. Obviously, with the virtual products, you can't deploy cards since there's nothing to plug them into. So you can't take advantage of the acceleration silicon or the HSM. There's another form of the virtual appliance that's also available. And um, if you are, uh, if you have an Amazon um, web account, you can actually uh, go up into the Amazon uh, web developer environment and actually check this out. And that's our AMI, our Amazon Machine Image. And again, this has uh, almost identical capabilities to our VMware and hardware appliances. There are some slight differences, uh, primarily because of Amazon's environment where you can't access the external internet uh, as freely. And uh, it's a product that's available up there. The image is uh, a public image. You can go down and you can uh, instantiate it and, um, and uh, interact with it and um, run a series of test suites and anything else you want against it. That is posted up on Amazon as a publicly available free image for now. You can also purchase the image if you want to have a reserved instance as well. Uh, supports all of the various uh, Amazon environments uh, from Amazon Web Services, uh, including uh, the on-demand reserved instances from EC2. And it's really designed for people who want to create either POCs in the cloud or limited implementations in the cloud. Um, this is obviously a product that we think will grow over time as people feel more comfortable with having more critical capabilities up in the cloud. So it gives you an idea of uh, what a product like this would look like in the cloud. And again, you know, it has similar capabilities to our appliances. Um, the policies are identical, so you can actually migrate policies back and forth. The only limitations are really those imposed by the Amazon Web Services environment, which are relatively few. To manage all of these instances that we've been talking about, um, there's kind of two solutions. I'm going to concentrate on the one that most of our customers can interact with. And I think the one that probably would be most relevant to the next part of the discussion, which is you know, how do you actually migrate from a Cisco product to, let's say, a Layer 7 product. And that is our Layer 7 manager. Our manager is a piece of software. Um, it's available in three different ways. Um, one way is you just open up a browser and uh, point it at one of our gateways, and uh, it will open up a manager, which is actually going to be managing that entire cluster. You can also get it as a thick client. The thick client looks absolutely identical, um, behaves exactly the same. It's, it's a GUI-based, drag-and-drop type environment. Um, the thick client can be advantageous in those areas where you don't want to deploy a browser. I always find it somewhat ironic we call it the thick client, but if you actually look at most modern web browsers, they take up far more disk space than the thick client would. But there are situations where people either um, can't or won't deploy browsers on client machines, and the thick client becomes a convenient alternative for them. Um, that's available as a runtime executable for Java as well, uh, sorry, for uh, Windows, as well as a, a Java-based client that will run on any um, Linux, Unix type environment, including Solaris. Uh, we also have an API available. Uh, the API gives you all the same capabilities as the Secure Span Manager uh, in an API form. That's generally for environments where you want a headless system that's running and you want to have our product configured by some other product. Um, that's of most interest generally to uh, telecom and financial services customers. But uh, it gives you the same set of capabilities that you see here represented on the screen. And those capabilities include things like the ability to 
uh, build and edit policies. It's a fully graphical environment. Um, it looks somewhat like a scripting language where we have these atomic policy elements we call assertions. And these elements do different things like signing messages, um, validating credentials, issuing SAML tokens, doing message transforms, searching messages using XPath or regex, and so on. Um, like a programming language, we support branching, and we have you know, the ability to compare things. We even have variables that you can access, which are local and global variables that you can interact with to build very, very rich, complex policies. In fact, I was looking at a policy just the other day from one of our customers and was uh, totally amazed by what they were doing with the policy language, but it was a, a fairly deep and complex policy, but they were doing a lot of interactions in our product, and it was a better solution than what they were currently using. So it's quite powerful, um, or it can be very, very simple. It's entirely up to you in terms of how you structure the policy. Um, there's a built-in validation tool which uh, spots obvious errors in policy logic and kind of steps you through the policy to make sure you're not doing um, silly things as well. Um, that product also helps deploy our policies. So when you make changes in our um, Secure State Manager, not only are those policies versioned and can be rolled back if necessary, they're also replicated immediately across uh, any members of the same Secure Span logical cluster. That gives you the ability to hook up to one gateway, interact with it, create different policies, and know that those policies are going to be propagated amongst the same logical uh, cluster. And that includes the ability to um, even feed some of that information to our XML VPN client, which we're not going to talk about today. Uh, you can also store those policies in a UDDI registry or pull them back. And there's a number of other things that you can do with UDDI registries uh, as well with our product, um, specifically around other entities and monitoring, things like that. From an operational standpoint, what the Layer 7 Manager gives you is it gives you the ability to look into the health and status of members of the Secure Span clusters. Um, it gives you the ability to troll through audit logs and um, other logs, operational logs that are captured uh, by our product, as well as the ability to configure our product to forward that information somewhere else. Most of our customers have audit syncs that they deploy audits to, as well as various network management systems, and some of those are the more traditional ones like HP OpenView, some are the more specialized um, SOA management systems, service management systems from companies like Progress Action Al and uh, other companies that may be out there. But you know, fundamentally, you can configure how our product interacts with your operational ecosystem through this manager as well. So it's kind of a, a one-stop shop for the various day-to-day -day operations that you would want to ha um, have as far as interactions are concerned with our product. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and given what you've just seen around you know, how Layer 7 product works and, and how it all fits together, I want to talk a little bit about um, a specific customer case study. Now, we've had several engagements with customers who've been looking to replace the Cisco products, um, and looking at our products, obviously, that's how we have these conversations. But I want to focus in on one. I have to be reasonably careful as to how detailed I get here for obvious reasons, but I want to give you a sense of the problem that they were trying to solve, how they attacked it, and get into a little bit of detail in terms of what the mechanics of that really look like. So the problem that the customer had was that their existing AXG was you know, lacking support for some very specific um, attributes that were tied into um, some specification compliance issues. This was leading to issues with interactions with third-party systems. And you can imagine that you would see a problem when you were trying to use a new version of an IDE to build an application to access a service, but the service didn't support the necessary hooks or attributes for that um, application to work properly. And the other issue they were having was overall performance was beginning to bog them down. They were running into scenarios where the product simply could not keep up, and so they were looking to deploy more of the product. Um, based on interactions they had with Cisco, they determined none of that was a viable option, that it was unlikely that... Uh, these particular features were going to be supported ever in the product. And in fact, uh, the conversation was along the lines of, well, we're just continuing the product anyway. So now they hit a point where you know, the AXG was actually blocking deployment of these services. It was uh, becoming a fairly significant issue for them. What they did was they did a survey in the marketplace. They talked to a few vendors, including ourselves. And they looked at our secure span XML networking gateway. And the simple way to describe it was they dropped the gateway in and then they migrated the policies um, over um, from the Cisco product to the Layer 7 product. There's a little bit more detail than that. Uh, I wish it was that simple, but it's not necessarily quite that simple. But there are some logical steps that we follow through. So in this case, our client services folks um, engage with the customer to create an implementation plan. And this is pretty standard procedure for Layer 7 when we deploy any of our products. 
Um, but what the client did was they came back to us with information on all the existing services and policies. So somewhat uniquely for us, instead of having the client do development around our product uh, as they deploy the services, the services, the policies, everything else had already been figured out, and they had that information. In fact, they even had some members of the original team. So we engaged with that team to understand what they were doing. And then one of our client services folks actually sat down with our customer, broke the problem down a little bit, and actually helped them migrate the first few policies. And you can think of that as sort of a validation step, but in a lot of ways it was training. And what they were learning was just understanding any semantic differences between the products and some things that our product did differently than Cisco and hopefully better, um, and how to effectively and, 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 and quickly migrate their policies and services over. And obviously as we were doing this, um, we were doing testing to make sure that what we were doing incrementally was working properly. And this kind of helped the customer establish their own best practices. I think it's all great for vendors to suggest best practices based on a product in isolation, but the reality in terms of any customer environment is always very, very different. And I think customers need to develop their own best practices, but at the same time, they should ask vendors saying, hey, you understand your product better than anyone else. You tell us how to use it the best possible way. Show us how to use it. And we'll define our own best practices based on what you can do and also the reality of the environment that we're deploying the product in. And after that, the client completed the balance of the migration and the final acceptance testing. So after that, they were off and running. They were migrating their own policies. They had limited interaction with us in terms of the odd question that would pop up. But fundamentally, they completed the rest of the migration themselves. This was a fairly smooth process. Um, it definitely happened over a period of months from the standpoint of them selecting the product, getting familiar with it, um, trialing it out, um, creating the implementation plan, and so on and so forth. But it was a pretty smooth process. They met all of their, uh, the dates that they had in mind and were quite happy with the end result and got past their blocking issue, which is really the key. And they did this with minimal downtime. They kept the uh, Cisco ACE product working in parallel, and as they migrated services over, they effectively just turned them off on the Cisco product, turned them on on our product, and had a uh, network load balancer take care of the actual um, Internet routing uh, protocols required to uh, have those two products working in parallel with each other. So let's get into a little bit more detail about how you actually migrate policies from one product to another. As you can imagine, you know, Cisco's environment is effectively a proprietary environment as is ours. We, we both take different ways to solve the same problem. But when you actually go below the surface, there's actually a lot of commonalities. Um, when it comes down to it, if you want to do encryption of XML messages, there's only so many different ways to do it. For example, or if you want to authenticate a user against an LDAP, there's only so many ways you can make that work. So luckily, between the two products, the atomic level differences, that is the actual step-by-step -step functional things you can do with a product, are pretty similar um, in most cases. So taking an existing policy and moving it over to the Layer 7 product is almost a matter of doing a literal translation, if you will, um, of the policy language. But the best way to sort of make this happen is uh, based on some collaboration we've had with various customers who've done the same thing, and I want to try and you know, expose that to you so you can kind of learn from uh, what we've been through and what our customers have been through. First and most importantly is to really understand the content of any shared policies between services. Many of our customers will do a common authentication scheme or a common um, schema validation scheme for different services. They may actually take atomic elements of policy and use those as global chunks that they share out amongst various other services. It's really important to understand what those are because there are dependencies there that are important later on. So you generally look at attacking the common elements first to make sure that you understand very succinctly what that's going to look like going forward because there's only a lot of services that depend upon those common shared elements. The other is then is take those shared elements and we implement those what we call fragments. And policy fragments in our lexicon are merely subsets of a policy. For us, a policy is always tied to a service. In this case, this is a policy that's not tied to a service. And you can think of it almost like an inline, except it's in the same policy language, or you can think of it as a subroutine or any other you know, programming construct. But fundamentally, it's, it's a global chunk of policy. Um, you then have to do things like determine actual entity mapping. So you have to determine, you know, are there specific identities, schemas, transforms, endpoints, or even certificates for that matter that have to be part of that service or part of that policy? And understand what those are, where you're going to get them, and what they look like. And then implement those on the SecureSpan product as well. 
So if you have a bunch of shared certificates that you want to put into our trust store, import them into the trust store. If there are schemas, understand where the schemas are. Make sure that the secure span product can get at those schemas or has the schemas included into its schema database. Um, and for each of the services, map the flow of the message to the policy. Understand the different paths that message can take through a policy. And then implement that um, on the secure span product as well. So instantiate the service and recreate the functional elements of the policy using the secure span product. Understanding what those flows look like, provided you have the other dependencies and, and, and relationships established in the earlier steps of this process, will give you a natural working service policy at the end of this, at which point you do an incremental test. Uh, testing that policy incrementally allows you to make sure that you know any of the common work you've done is working, but also allows you to sort of sign off on it at that point and then migrate the next service over and so on and so forth. This reduces the downtime. Um, it reduces any risk that you may have because you'll have another system operating in parallel and gives you a very, very clean migration from one product to the other. We have discovered, however, there are some really good critical factors for success. And I know I've talked about this a little bit, but I'm going to reemphasize this. Um, one is really a good working knowledge of the functional use cases and policies that you actually implemented, the bigger picture, if you will. Um, often, again, as staff has migrated away, if this uh, Cisco product was deployed some time ago, this may be challenging, but not having that information is going to impact you from both a technical compliance standpoint in terms of being able to do the migration, as well as the actual time and potential cost to do that migration. Um, also, you need to have the corresponding test cases. Again, may seem obvious, but being able to implement all of this and then having to recreate test cases, again, very time consuming, can be very expensive. But doing, having the test cases available and doing sort of a stepwise testing uh, make sure that you don't have any nasty surprises when you go to flip the entire system over. Um, take a cold, hard look at the versions and interface types of any third-party systems. It's possible if you deployed the Cisco AXG some number of years ago that, for example, your SiteMinder version has jumped from you know, SiteMinder 5.1 to SiteMinder 6.2 or something like that. You need to know that going into this process because there could be some pretty significant gotchas if all of a sudden you uh, port a policy over and discover that it won't talk to the latest and greatest version of your third-party uh, your third-party infrastructure. And again, that's more about knowledge, understanding what has changed in the original environment, and just making sure that you can accommodate that change. Um, again, entity-related information that includes credential keys, certificates, addresses, things like that seems relatively obvious, but you have to know those. Um, one of the important parts from our perspective is just have a good relationship with the vendor and a solid project plan. Uh, we do an implementation um, around every product that we sell. It sort of becomes second nature for us, but it's something that you need to engage in with the customer or with the client uh, and the vendor. Make sure that you have corresponding team members that uh, can talk to one another, because for some period of time, that vendor is going to be part of your project team, and they have deliverables they have to meet, and uh, they have to know about those deliverables. So clearly defined roles, uh, a good training plan uh, when you're doing the migration, and a good handoff procedure once it's all done. So you have a nice clean handoff, your staff is well trained, they know what they're doing, and they can continue to do the balance of the work themselves and maintain that system. So as we sit through this, I did mention that you know our customers did look at other vendors when they were replacing uh, the Cisco product, and that makes perfect sense. You want to do a survey of the marketplace Find out what out there, find out what is out there, and determine what the best path forward may be. But you know, why specifically layer seven? So this is the, the, the selling pitch a little bit, but it's also what our customers have told us. First off, XML firewalls are our core business. They're not an add-on business for us. This is how we make our money. If we succeed at this, we do well. If we fail at this, you know, we don't do well. And this is a very successful business for us. It is growing quite rapidly. But you know, unlike Cisco or unlike um, Intel or Alcatel or some other vendors that are out there, this isn't a very, very small product line in a very, very large company. This is our primary business. This is what we've been doing for a number of years. This is what we've kind of gathered expertise in. And this is kind of what we're known for. Um, we're consistently recognized as a market and technology leader. Um, Gartner has us as a technology leader in their magic quadrant, a variety of other analysts and press and other reviews that you can read publicly on the web and on our website um, talk about our capabilities. They talk about what our strengths are. They talk about you know, what we're known for in this marketplace. And we're definitely recognized as a market leader. We are subject, matters in this space, subject matter experts in this space, um, both from our own experiences internally, but also the interactions we've had with hundreds of customers, 
So you have some pretty good ideas on, on how to uh, make things work or how or what pitfalls that you might come into or just generally how how XML and um, and web services, uh, based services and REST and JSON and all these other different technologies, how they all work, how they work together, and even can help you make good choices about that going forward. We have a variety of deployment options to fit your needs. As you see, we have a variety of different products, but more importantly, we have a variety of different form factors. So if you have an instance where you don't need a hardware-based appliance, you have software alternative or you have a virtual alternative or any other combination thereof. So not only can we give you a solution which will work in your production environment, it will work in other environments you may have in your enterprise. And as you move forward and perhaps consider doing things like cloud migration, you have options that open to you there through our freedom license. And that really gives you a way to protect your investment going forward so that you're not locked into hardware uh, over the long term. The other thing to consider is we probably already sell products to your competition. Um, we have a very wide market, uh, um, very wide market deployment in just about every vertical you can probably name, uh, ranging from you know telecom, retail, and manufacturing to intelligence and defense agencies and public sector in general. Uh, we've been out in the marketplace for a while. We have a really great uh, collection of customers. Uh, many of whom are more than happy to discuss us as references, and we have a very, very high customer satisfaction rate. And again, this is our core business, and we need to maintain that business and make sure our customers are happy. Um, because it is our core business, and because we are doing well, we also have a growing product line. We're adding products pretty much continually. We added a, a whole cloud series of products this year. Later in the year, you're going to hear about a couple other product announcements as well. And we have a solid roadmap going into the future. We are continuing to invest in this product. Uh, we take customer feedback very, very seriously. We drive a lot of enhancements from customers into each and every release of our product, as well as new features and new capabilities that our customers maybe haven't encountered yet but soon will. So for us, you know, having that ongoing dialogue with customers is very, very important, and we're very responsive to customers' needs, and that's reflected into our roadmap as well. We also have a lot of experience helping customers uh, replace the Cisco a AXG. This is something that's probably been happening over the last, probably a year and a half or so, was when we first started getting approached by existing Cisco customers to replace their product. Um, it was something that we took on initially with some trepidation because it's always a little challenging um, going into an existing implementation and simply doing a drop-in replacement. As I've indicated, it's not quite that simple, but it's not far off. Uh, the functional capabilities of the products are, are very, very close. And really all it's about really doing is understanding you know, our way of doing things versus the Cisco way of doing things. We think we have a pretty good template now. We think we have a good formula for making that work, and our client services folks have become uh, experts uh, on the Cisco product in terms of you know, how to make those changes and, and how to deploy that in as smooth a way as possible. And I think we have some some great ways that we can help customers replace the uh, Cisco AXG product, or Cisco AXG product, and I think we've got some demonstrated success there. I'm going to leave the uh, webinar at this point, uh, you know, in terms of being complete. Um, for more information, if you want to find out more about um, any of the products I've mentioned today, um, you can go to our website, lord7tech.com. You can also contact our sales organization directly, um, or you can give us a call. And what I'd like to do now is answer a few questions. Um, okay, sorry, I'm just reading through the questions really carefully. Um, there's a question here about what's the difference between the virtual appliance and the hardware accelerator appliance. Does the networking product have uh, hardware, hardware acceleration? Um, all of our appliances, hardware-based appliances, have the option of having um, hardware-based acceleration, and that is an option. You uh, purchase that at the time you purchase the product. Um, the performance difference between the virtual appliance and the hardware accelerator appliance is interesting. Um, as processors continue to get faster and faster, that gap is closing, but the hardware still provides some pretty significant benefits um, on XML um, schema validation as well as um, XSL transforms. And we have a benchmarking lab here, a performance lab that runs 7 by 24. We're always running our own performance benchmarks to tune our product, but we're also running performance benchmarks from our customers. And uh, if you are a customer, I encourage you, if you're considering a migration and are concerned about performance, so let us know kind of what your, your parameters look like. You give us an idea of sample messages, services, policies, things like that. We'll reconstruct that environment here internally, run some tests, and actually show you what the results are. Because benchmarks are all well and good, but we all know that benchmarks don't generally reflect real-world applications. And in the real world, you're forced to do things that maybe aren't always ideal, but they have to be done. 
So it's something that we're also capable of doing here internally. Uh, another question was, ACE XML Gateway supports export of the policy as a WS policy format. Does Layer 7 uh, can support the import of the policy file in WS policy format? The answer is yes. But there is a problem. Um, WS policy is a somewhat incomplete standard from my perspective anyway. And that is WS policy defines a container for a policy. If you like, it defines the envelope. What can actually be inside that policy can be 100% proprietary. Uh, and that in itself causes a problem when you try and take a WS policy document from one product from one vendor and import it into another product from another vendor. Um, fundamentally, the only thing that's common lexicon there will be very, very low level, um, very, very, very low level policy pieces. So, for example, um, WS policy doesn't easily support things like branching and includes and things like that. So, we've added that to our product. So, yes, you can render products, policies, you know, in and out of us using WS policy, but that may actually not be the most expeditious way to do it. But again, if you've got some policies um, that you have uh, exported as XML or WS policy, feel free to contact one of our folks. Um, they can have a look at it, and they can give you an idea of what that migration might entail. Uh, another question, does Layer 7 support the WS Federation WS Trust protocol? Yes, we do. Um, WS Trust is primarily used for us to interface to STSs in a federated environment, and WS Federation is something that we did uh, some time ago in conjunction with uh, uh, Microsoft. At this point, I'm going to uh, close the webinar. Uh, this webinar will be available as a recording on our website. Again, if you have any questions, comments, or have any other uh, questions about any of the other Layer 7 products in addition to the ones that talked about here, feel free to visit our website or give us a call. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a great day.